Okay, so if you're watching this video, you should have already read through Passing Gas. If you haven't done that yet, go ahead and go back, finish reading the whole book, write down a few notes, and then come back to this video. Um, this video lecture, it should be actually pretty short after I edit it all together. Um, I'm coming at you from my apartment right now. Uh, I'm going to be doing it using my whiteboard that I have here. Um, and also, I got some balloons, since we're talking about gases. Um, I want to take a second and introduce you to my dog, Kalua. She's going to be helping me out with this lecture. Hey, Lua. Can you say hi? Say hi, Lua. Can you sit? Shake. Wow, what a good girl. Are you going to help me with some science, Lua? Yeah, good girl, Lua. Where's your toy? Lua, can you get your toy? Where's your toy? Oh, what a smart girl. Good girl, Lua. Okay, so we're talking about gases. This is something that we've talked about a lot at the beginning of the year, but now we're throwing math into the mix with the gas laws and the gas law equations. Um, you may want to take some notes on this lecture. A lot of it will probably be review, but some of it is definitely going to be new. Um, I'm going to go over the review part first. When we think about gases, we know that gases are the highest entropy of the states of matter that we've talked about. It means that they got a lot of chaos, they're going all over the place. Uh, we know that they don't have a definite shape. I can change a gas into any sort of shape I want it to be. Um, and I know that it'll have an indefinite volume as well. Essentially, gases are going to fill whatever space you give them. Whatever volume they're put into, they're going to fill that whole thing up. So if I had a sealed container here, like my water bottle, and I seal this off so that now essentially no gas can get in or out, all the gas in here is going to fill this entire space. That doesn't mean that it has a defined shape. If I open this up, its shape is going to change again. All it means is that it'll fill this volume if it gets sealed in here. Um, I have some quick notes that I wrote down on my whiteboard. If you're not sure what you should write for this part, uh, I would make sure that you get these points down in your notes, just in case you don't already have these down. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit so that you can write this down real quick. Uh, and in the next segment, we're going to start talking about the gas laws. This is the new part, the new part that we haven't talked about yet. Okay, so one of the gas laws that we read about was Charles's law. And we're actually going to do a quick demo on Charles's law. As a reminder, Charles's law says that V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Uh, this is something that you're definitely going to want to have down in your notes. Um, and what this means is that the initial volume over the initial temperature is equal to the final volume over the final temperature. I could change this to be VI for V initial if I wanted to. And I could change this one to VF for V final. It's just important that you know that one side of the equation has the initial values, and the other side has the final values. So what we're going to do in this demo, I'm going to take a balloon, I'm going to blow it up, and then I'm going to put it in my freezer here. And the idea is that if the temperature is going from a larger number to a smaller number, because we're getting colder, right? We're losing temperature, or we're decreasing in temperature then if that happens, the volume should also decrease. This balloon should get smaller. It should shrink a little bit after I put it in the freezer and leave it there for a little bit. But let's find out if that really happens. Let's experiment. You want to help me blow up this balloon, Lua? You want to help? Yeah. See? There it is. OK, here we go. I think we scared Lua. That's all right, though. We did it, Lua. See? There we go, Lua. You wanna play? What do you think? Oh, you scaredy cat. You're so scared, Lua. It's okay. It's alright. It's not gonna hurt you. So apparently I can add balloons to the long list of things that Lua is afraid of. 
Anyways, we got our balloon now. It's blown up all the way. We can see this is what it looks like at its uh, V1, its initial volume. Let's see what it looks like with its final volume at the end. But first, we need to change the temperature. So I'm going to put this in the freezer. We'll come back to it later. Okay, so we talked about Charles's law. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the other two laws, Gay-Lussac's law and Boyle's law. Uh, those are the three that we've got so far. Um, we'll talk about the ideal gas law down the line. Uh, we're not there yet, so we're just worrying about these three for now. Right now, let's take a look at Gay-Lussac's law. It's a French name. Um, so, this law, it looks a whole lot like Charles's law did. It's set up the same. The only things that we changed is that now we have pressure here. This P is for pressure instead of volume. And we can see that Gay-Lussac's law is a proportional relationship. In other words, as the pressure increases, so will the temperature. If I've got a higher pressure value, I'm going to have a higher temperature reading. If the temperature goes up, the pressure will also go up. So this is Gay-Lussac's law. Now, let's talk about Boyle's law. Alright, so Boyle's law. Boyle's law is the relationship between pressure, P, and volume, V. Now you can tell that this one looks different from the other ones that we've looked at. That's because this one is an inverse relationship. Uh, in other words, this time as pressure increases, the volume is actually going to decrease. So another way that I could say that, as I turn up the gas pressure, the volume of that gas is going to get compressed. It's going to get smaller. I could do it the other way. If I'm making this gas fill up a bigger and bigger volume, that means that the volume is increases, the pressure of that gas is actually going to decrease. That's what we mean by an inverse relationship. Okay, one last thing before we check on our balloon that's in the freezer right now. Uh, I'd like to talk about the units of pressure. We've talked about temperature in this class a little bit. We talked about volume a little bit. We haven't, talk we haven't talked about pressure too much yet, so I want to spend some time on that. Uh, when we talk about pressure, we're talking about how much force is being applied to a certain area. So if I was pressing on something and I was using a lot of force, that would increase the amount of pressure that's on that area. If I'm not using very much force, that's not a lot of pressure that's on that area. Uh, the way that we measure pressure, the units that we use, uh, in this class, it'll mostly be atmospheres. Sometimes we abbreviate that to this ATM for atmosphere. There are other units of um, pressure, like pascals or pounds per square inch, uh, but for, in this case, in this class, we're mostly going to be dealing with atmospheres. And I want to explain this beautiful drawing that I did. Um, the reason that we use atmospheres, it's very convenient. At sea level, the atmospheric pressure is exactly 1.00 atmospheres. It is one atmosphere at sea level. Now, at Indiana, we're just a little bit above sea level. We probably hang out somewhere around 0 0.99 atmospheres. So we've got a little bit less pressure on us than people who live right on the beach, right at sea level. Um, for example, Colorado is at an even higher elevation. They've got even less pressure um, up there. And you see things about um, athletes that train in these high ele elevation um, areas. Uh, it's because of this different in, difference in pressure. Um, training there can be good for your body sometimes. And then at the very tippy top here, um, this is supposed to represent Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. The atmospheric pressure there is only 0 0.33 atmospheres, a third of what it is at sea level. It's pretty extreme. Um, this is also why climbers that climb Mount Everest, 
they have to stop and rest um, and make camp at certain points along the way. And that's not because of ex exhaustion or anything. It is partially because of that. But if they try to just go straight up without letting themselves acclimate, that um, change in pressure so quickly would be really bad for their bodies. So they need to um, let themselves acclimate a little bit to the new pressures. Uh, and then once their body gets used to it a little bit, then they can climb a little higher um, and then acclimate again and so on and so forth. Okay, before we check on our um, experiment, before we check on the balloon, I want to correct something that I said earlier. Um, I said that the lower pressures are the reason why altitude, altitude training works. Uh, that's not entirely true. Um, the lower pressure makes it so that there's also a lower pressure of oxygen in the air. So when these, it's usually endurance athletes that do this, but when they train at these high altitudes, they're actually, their bodies are getting less oxygen than they normally would. When that happens, the body compensates um, by increasing red blood cell count and uh, things like this, um, so that when they go back to their home altitude, their home elevation, um, their body still has these extra red blood cells and things. That's what helps them. That's what gives them the uh, competitive edge. It's not necessarily that there's lower pressure physically exerted on their bodies. Um, that was just a mistake that I made. I didn't want you to go home with any misconceptions. All right, let's check on our balloon. Okay, so unfortunately, um, this balloon didn't shrink quite as much as I had been hoping for, but I mean, I only left it in there for an hour, less than an hour, so it's not going to be a huge effect. Um, it is a little bit colder than it was when I put it in. So because the temperature changed, the volume also changed. Uh, I can tell, I can compress this a little bit more than I could before. Um, so the volume definitely did change a little bit. The temperature changed a little bit. If I had left this in for much longer, say overnight, um, it would have uh, shriveled up um, probably to about half this size. Um, I've done this experiment before. Uh, I know that it's something that does work. Uh, we'll probably do this in class at some point and we'll see a bigger effect than this. Um, but hopefully this will help you remember that as the temperature decreases, the volume will also decrease because it's a proportional relationship, according to Charles's law. Lua, you want to see a balloon, Lua? You want to see the balloon? Does it look smaller to you, Lua? Okay, say goodbye, Lua. Oh, no, sit. Can you say goodbye? Say bye-bye. Uh, this is something that we've covered a lot at the beginning of the year, but now we're going to um, throw math into the equation. <laughs> um, I have to start over, that was horrible. We're going to use the units of atmospheres, and we use ATM to... Ooh. It's just important that you know that the first volume over the second temp... Or the, uh, the, the first volume over the first temperature is equal to the first... Oh my god, I need to start over. Oh, you don't care. You're scared. You're hearing noises. Something's got you anxious, doesn't it? Okay, bye, Lua.